so as I said, today is going to be a session talking about different things you can do uh, to help when you're living with Axial Spa and to help with your daily activities around the home. Um, that is particularly helpful for people if they're living on their own, but I do think all of the tips and tricks that I'll share will be helpful um, whether you live on your own or with others. So firstly, just to understand kind of why we're doing this session, essentially we, we know that with Axial Spa, uh, you're living with that daily pain and daily fatigue. Um, for different people, it will be to different extents, but often um, either daily or just during flare ups, you can find that that pain and fatigue really impacts your ability to do your usual day to day activities. So all these tips and tricks are to help, whether it's in that flare stage or if you live with that pain daily and that fatigue daily. Hopefully these simple changes can make a really big difference to your day to day life. So firstly, just thinking about whether you have a daily routine or whether your, your symptoms fluctuate through the day. If you're like me, you may well wake up like the Tin Man here and in the morning find that your symptoms are a lot worse. So your pain, your joint stiffness and your fatigue are a lot worse until you've been able to get up and get moving for a period of time. If you find that you're in the same boat, then it could be really helpful just to spend 15 minutes the night before preparing things uh, ready for the next day so that in the morning you've got things all set up and ready to go for you. So, for example, you could put your clothes out for the next day. You could get everything that you need for breakfast out and leave it at an accessible level so that you're not bending and reaching into low cupboards first thing in the morning. You can fill the kettle with the right amount of water again so you're not having to lift first thing. And even putting your towel and any bath products out somewhere where it's easily, easily accessible so that first thing in the morning, you're not having to do those really big tasks. It just means that it gives you that, that extra help when you are loosening up and waking up ready for the day. Now, when we're looking at how you can do all of the, the daily activities that you want to do while still looking after yourself, the four P's that we use to describe pacing and managing fatigue in general can be really helpful. So these four P's are pacing, planning, prioritizing, and problem solving. I'll go through all of them uh, now. And when I go through all of them in one go, it does sound like quite a lot. So I do recommend if you're going to look at adding any of these into your day-to-day -day tasks or, or your daily habits, then just pick one thing to do at a time. So you pick one new habit and then you try and build that into your own routine. And then gradually, once that's part of your routine and you don't really think about it anymore, you can then bring something else in. So don't feel overwhelmed like you've got to make lots of big changes all at once. It's really about just finding those small changes you can make gradually and they can really help long term then. So first, I'll be chatting about pacing. Uh, so the, the, the cake here is to represent kind of everything we want to do. And then that slice is how we're going to pace it down and chunk it down. So rather than doing everything all in one go, how can you slice up those activities? And I will admit personally, with I have Axial Spa too, and I find that pacing is probably one of the most difficult and frustrating things to do. But when you do have a focus on it and you do try to make those changes and really break things down, it can make a really big difference overall um, and long term, enabling you to do more, but with less um, kickback of the symptoms of the pain and fatigue you may experience. So essentially with pacing, we'd recommend looking at the tasks that you want to do either for that day or for that week and try to break those individual tasks down into even smaller steps. So then those smaller steps you can spread out throughout the day or throughout the week. You can put in rest breaks and different activities in between. And it just means that you're still likely to get the same amount done, but you're not going to then do it all in one go and then find that you have to rest and recover for a long period afterwards. When I did a, a Facebook Live about gardening, I shared a similar sort of tip on pacing and how you can break tasks down and, and look at tasks that affect your body in different ways. So, for example, I recommended that you wouldn't do all of your weeding in one go where you're kneeling and, and stretching forward. You'd perhaps do a little bit of weeding. And then when you feel like that's straining your back a little bit, you can move on to something where it's standing height, like potting plants. And then again, you can move on to something where you're reaching higher up. So you're using your body in different ways. Well, you can use this technique in lots of things, not just gardening. So when you think about your daily activities, if you've got some activities where you'll be sitting, some where you'll be standing, and some that are more energetic, look at the way you're structuring your day and see if you can break these tasks up so that you're using your body in different ways. So you may do the standing task first, and then when you feel like you need a break, you can then sit down and do those seated tasks. And it can just be helpful in reducing the fatigue and the pain you experience, but again, still allowing you to get the things that you want to, to get done, you can get through those. 
Now, the next P is planning. So this is something I, I personally enjoy doing, but I know lots of people don't like having lists and plans and things like that. But it can be really helpful when you live with chronic fatigue, just thinking ahead and planning ahead um, to try and just manage your energy levels as best you can. So the idea is that when you look ahead and plan ahead, you try to spread your activities out evenly over a number of days rather than having everything falling on one day. For example, if you look ahead and, and realize that you've got a few activities each day, you can perhaps schedule in your, your uh, general chores and tasks like cleaning and things like that around your other activities. So on those quieter days, you could maybe clean one room and then on the busier days, you would, you would avoid that. So it's just looking at making sure that you're balancing things out. Um, you're still getting things done, but without that kick, but kickback of symptoms. And similarly, if you notice that you know, sometimes we do have days where lots of things fall on one day and it just happens like that. You can look at the days before and see how you can help set yourself up for those. So, for example, if you've got a few days where you're going to be working fairly late, um, can you spend the, the few days before doing some batch cooking and freezing some portions? So that then on those busy days, you've got those meals ready to go. It's one thing less to do on those busy days. But obviously eating well is really important at keeping our energy level up as well. So just thinking about in the run up to the busier days, what can you do to help make those days easier can be really helpful. Now, prioritizing. So this really ties into the planning as well. Um, if you find that you like to have to do lists, sometimes it can feel quite overwhelming when you have a huge to do list and you're really struggling with your pain and fatigue. So a really good technique is to actually create a grid where you break down your different tasks into their urgency and how important they are. And this is really helpful in helping you prioritize those tasks. So on the right side of the, the screen here, I've broken them down into tasks that are urgent or non-urgent, and then important and not important. And the idea is that the task you would do first are those that are urgent and important. So you put those at the top of your list, highlight them that they're the ones to get done first when you do have that time and energy. The next tasks you then look at are the tasks which are important, but they're not urgent. So with these, you'd look and you decide when are you going to schedule these in? So they may not need doing immediately, but can you look ahead at your weekly plan and schedule those in? Then the next tasks you take a look at are those that are urgent, but not important. So these may be tasks that you can ask friends or family for help with. You can delegate or you can get someone in to help you with those. And then the final group, the tasks, which once you actually break things down and look at them, you realize they're not urgent and they're not important. So with those, you'd be looking at, you know, whether you want to be doing them at all. Are they things that you can get rid of, take them off the to-do list? Because if they're not urgent and not important, do they need to get done? So this way of looking at your tasks can be a great thing to do either at the beginning of the week or at the beginning of a month, even at the beginning of a work day when you've got lots on, just helping you to prioritize that list. Meaning if you're starting with those tasks that are urgent and important, you can then find that if, if later in the day you've got less energy than you felt you did have and you need to take a break, I think mentally it can be a lot easier because you know you've got those most urgent and important tasks done. And it just takes the pressure off a little bit. And I think also reassessing your to-do list every now and then is really good because you may well find that some of those tasks do fall into that last group and you realize that although they're on your list and can feel quite overwhelming, they may not need to get done at all. Now, the final P is problem solving. So we've got a couple of cryptic images here. Uh, so really, it's just looking at your day to day activities and your routines and thinking about how you could maybe do them differently. So, for example, the stairs on the left here, that's to represent uh, a simple idea to have something like a box or a basket at the bottom of the stairs so that if you find that stairs are tiring and difficult, as you go through your day, if there's things that you need to take upstairs, just pop them into that box or basket. And then at the end of the day, take them up all in one go, rather than having lots of trips up and down the stairs through the day. And similarly, looking at things like mobility aids and things like that. So the picture here is with Nordic walking sticks. So that's a really good activity for your axial spa. But just thinking about other things like, like mobility aids and whether they'd be helpful for you to get things done um, and do the activities you want to do, but with less of that pain and fatigue. So for example, I use a walking stick when I'm out and about, and I've found that helps me to be more active and to be doing more, uh, but with less pain and less fatigue afterwards. So for me, just thinking outside the box a little bit 
has helped me to do that. And those, that stick is particularly helpful on days when my SI joint is flaring and getting around the house can even be difficult. So it can be useful to have a few different tools and gadgets around the house um, for those, those more difficult days, especially when you live on your own. Now with exercise, um, we know that it can be really tricky to keep motivated to exercise. Um, with axial spar, it's one of those conditions that we need to be keeping moving regularly. Um, and that means sort of every day. And when you wake up with pain and fatigue, it can be really hard to, to get your mindset in that, you know, your mind in that mindset and get yourself going and ready to exercise. But especially when you live on your own because you don't have someone there who can help remind you. So I'm just going to share a few simple tricks that might be helpful if you do find that you need that, that added motivation to keep moving regularly. So firstly, having someone who um, would go with you to help motivate you um, can be really good. And also it can mean that the exercise isn't necessarily just exercise. It's also socializing. You know, you could be walking to a local coffee shop with a friend rather than just going out for a walk on your own. And obviously that's much more motivation to do that then. Similarly, some people find that if you join with a paid subscription, that can be uh, an added incentive, uh, particularly if you've already booked something, so you've got it in the diary um, and you feel like you need to then turn up. So that can be a good, good added incentive. Just tracking your steps using something like a pedometer, you can get some you know, really cheaply online now. Um, and whether you share your steps each day with a friend or family member to act as motivation, or you just keep a monitor on them yourself. And perhaps if you get a bit competitive with yourself and try and do a little bit more each day, that can be a really good way of keeping motivated. And a cheaper alternative to a pedometer or a free alternative is using something like sticky notes around the house. So just a reminder that keeping moving regularly throughout the day is really important. And in fact, you know, just as important as getting out and about. So you can use sticky notes somewhere where you'll see those regularly through your, your regular day. For example, you can pop them on the fridge. So when you get, get some food, it just reminds you to do a few stretches or exercises. You can pop them uh, next to the kettle. So when you're waiting for the kettle to boil or next to the bathroom mirror. So when you're cleaning your teeth, you can do a few stretches and exercises. This just means that you're getting moving regularly throughout the day, which is really important for, for your axial spa. And it's just that, that visual reminder for you to do those. And then finally, having a community of people around you to support you is really, really helpful. Uh, so our NAS branches are open across the UK and I've popped the link here to our branch finder. So you can go on our website, pop in your postcode and see if there's a branch local to you. But also I have put the details for NAS Bristol here as well because they're a branch who run online sessions and they're open to anyone across the UK with Axial Spa. So these groups are excellent because they mean that you meet other people, uh, particularly local people who also have Axial Spa. They give you an opportunity to exercise together, but also there's that social element as well. And particularly when you live on your own, I think it's really important to have that social contact with people um, and particularly people who really understand what you're going through with your Axial Spa. I will pause just to say welcome to everyone who's joining. So feel free to pop any questions in the comments because we'll have some time at the end for me to answer those. Now, the next topic is talking about preparing for flares. Uh, now, I have done a whole video previously on creating a flare toolkit. So if you haven't seen that before, I definitely recommend heading over to, to the link when I share the slides after the session and having a look at how you can create your own personal flare toolkit. That's essentially somewhere where you can put all of the things that help you during a flare all in one place. So when that flare happens, you know exactly where to go to find those things that are helpful for you and to hopefully ease the pain and, and fatigue you're experiencing. But particularly if you live on your own, I think having that flare toolkit set up and ready to go is really important. And especially if you wake in the night with quite severe symptoms, it's much more reassuring if you know you've got somewhere to go to get that, that help. But also keeping a note of who you can ask for help as well. So if you're living on your own and you're struggling with that flare, making sure that you've got your healthcare team's details written down somewhere in that, in that flare toolkit, and also the details of friends and family who you can contact for help is really important. Now, cooking when you, when you have Axial Spa, um, I'll go through a few kind of practical tips, but also then we'll talk a little bit about how we can stay motivated to, to cook um, fresh food as well when living alone, because I know it can be easy to get out of that habit. Lots of people ask me for advice on how they can keep cooking uh, fresh food because they find it difficult with chopping and preparing food. 
both with with pain, particularly in the hands and the um, upper body, but also with energy levels as well. So firstly, I do recommend buying um, frozen prepared veg, fruit and veg because this can just free up so much time and so much energy. Um, but with that, that food that's freshly frozen from being prepared, it's still going to be really nutritious as well. So even if it's just something you have in the freezer for when you're flaring or when you're in a hurry, um, just having those uh, frozen prepared things or even tinned, um, uh, tinned food can be really helpful just to take the pressure off a little bit. Also taking a look at the different tools and gadgets that are helpful so you can get all sorts of different gadgets that take the pressure off the hands and wrists. And I'll share some links at the end to a website where you can look at the different things available and see if they could be helpful for you. But the bigger gadgets can be really helpful as well. So looking at food processors, uh, food mixers, uh, particularly coming into the autumn and winter months, things like slow cookers and air fryers. These can be really helpful, again, just to take some of that um, the manual labour out of things. So it's saving you that time, that energy um, and also some pain if you experience pain in your um, in your hands or arms. And of course, looking at um, your the layout of your kitchen is really important as well. So looking at things like um, if you have things in easy reach that you use quite frequently, particularly if you use some of those heavier gadgets like food mixers regularly, having them out on the kitchen counter can be really helpful because then you're not having to bend and, and lift and get those regularly. But also making use of things like wheeled storage trolleys. So not only are they good for storing things, but you can also use them if you're moving a heavy pot or pan between different areas. For example, going from the cooker to the sink to drain something, having it on a wheeled trolley can just save you having to carry it that long distance as well. And as I said, keeping motivated to cook from, from fresh when you are living on your own can be quite difficult, particularly if you're in a flare or if you have that pain and fatigue, it's really easy to go for something um, you know, simpler. Um, but my advice really is just to, to focus on trying new things because it keeps that interest and that motivation there. But also I've shared a link here to the BBC Good Food website because they've got a whole section on meals for, for one. Um, so they're meals that are easier to cook for one person. But also, as I mentioned earlier, batch cooking and cooking bigger amounts and then freezing them and saving them for days when you have less energy is really helpful, too. So just focusing on, on trying new things um, and really just sort of, you know, keeping that, that idea fresh. You do deserve um, the, the meals and you deserve to try new things as well. So that can be really exciting. Now, cleaning, I will admit that for me, when when I'm in pain and when I'm flaring, Cleaning is probably one of the first things to go lower on my to-do list um, and one of the things I avoid um, and I'd, you know, I'd rather keep on top of things. So I know it is really difficult when it is hard to keep on top of cleaning. What I would recommend definitely is looking at the different gadgets available. Uh, even if you just go on Amazon and type in you know, different like electric scrubbing brushes, things like that, there are so many different options out there now and quite re reasonably priced as well. So it's well worth looking into those. Um, as I said, for the, the cooking section as well, um, I'll share a link at the end of the slides to a website where you can go and put in um, what you're struggling with and what your needs are, and it will come out with some different ideas for, for gadgets and tools that can be helpful. So do have a look at that. Um, personally, my favourite thing that I found in, in recent years is an electric scrubbing brush that I use to clean the bath and the shower. And it can be so helpful because um, it's got a long handle that you can adjust and the actual head of the brush um, rotates. It's electric um, and rechargeable, and it just takes so much pressure out of scrubbing. I don't have to bend down too much now or reach too high up. Um, and it means that I can keep on top of things a lot more than I used to, um, while still making sure that I'm you know, preserving my energy and, and not causing a flare up as well. With cleaning, as I mentioned earlier, when you're looking ahead and planning your week, it can be good to think about the different cleaning tasks that you've got to come up and making sure that you plan them in so you're doing little amounts and often. It can be really tempting just to want to blitz the whole place and all in one go, and that can be really satisfying. But some people find that if they do that, then afterwards they get that pain and fatigue um, or they get that flare up afterwards. So just looking at how you can schedule things in and do it little and often can be really helpful. And of course, adapting uh, your different techniques as well. So um, looking at maybe can you, when you're ironing, can you sit and iron or sit and fold laundry, different things like that, or, or get one of the small handheld hoovers so that each day you keep on top of 
um, on top of things using the handheld hoover, meaning you're using the full heavier hoover less frequently. It's just looking at our usual habits and usual routines and just thinking about if we can do those differently. Now, there are lots of different adaptations you can make in the bathroom. Um, for example, a shower stool can mean that you're, you're able to sit and rest when you're showering, which can preserve a lot of energy. Um, if you find that getting in and out of the bath is difficult, there are some bath seats that are available that sit across the bath um, that are electric, but then they can lower and raise you in and out of the bath. And that can be great, particularly if you find that you don't have the strength to push up with your arms um, or you have problems with your knees. It can be a good way that then means you're still able to have a bath, but you're able to get in and out much more comfortably. <clears throat> um, your local council may be able to install grab rails as well if you find that that would be helpful um, for getting in and out of things or you know, just for the safety element as well. I'll share some information shortly about how you can get things assessed by the council if you did want some of those adaptations made for you. Um, and also there are um, techniques for sitting down and standing up from the toilet if you find that's difficult. Even during a flare, you can get um, devices that raise the toilet seat up um, and have handles as well, so it can make it a lot more comfortable and a lot more accessible too. So as I said, there, there are facilities available for your local council to help make you um, help you make those adaptations to your home. So if you are thinking that perhaps some adaptations would be helpful, um, I've popped the link here where you can find your local council's webpage about the support and advice they can provide and the equipment they can provide as well. So it's worth checking out what your local council provides, but most of them will be able to make adaptations to your home up to the value of a thousand pounds per adaptation. So it can be things like, um, like installing ramps uh, in you know, adding those grab rails and things like that. Um, but also for any bigger adaptations that they may recommend um, that we've put a link here to the financial support for making those bigger adaptations. If that's something, you know, like a stair lift or something like that, if you wanted that in your home. And the, uh, the link that I've been mentioning a few times through the, the talk um, is this link here, Living Made Easy. So this is a really great website where you can go and put in uh, the things that you're struggling with or the things you'd like advice on, and it will come out with different project products and gadgets that can be helpful for that. So you can get an idea of the cost of those, whether you'd want to self-finance them, or it can just give you some ideas that if you were having um, an occupational therapist from the council come in and assess your home, it can give you some ideas on the different products that you could perhaps ask them if they can provide as well. And it's really important to think as well about the financial assistance available too, because I know that some of the things I've mentioned today, and um, particularly buying different gadgets and things like that, if the council aren't able, able to provide them, um, they do come at a cost and they do really add up. So we always recommend looking at whether you're entitled to the personal independence payments, that's the PIP benefit. So this benefit is it's not means tested, it's not income related, um, and it's available for people with long term conditions to help provide an added income so that they can pay for anything of, that causes extra costs related to their condition. So if you're buying you know, gadgets in the kitchen, um, you know, a shower stall, things like that, it's all related to your condition. So this benefit is to provide that that income to, to cover those costs. If you were looking at applying for the PIP benefit, then do speak to my colleague, Gary. I've popped his email address there because he's, a, he's able to write um, with the information you provide an impact letter explaining what the condition is and how it impacts you. And that can be really helpful uh, when filling out your application form and also to send in with your application form to give them a bit more information as well. I've also linked to the Turn to Us charity. Um, they're a fantastic charity who offer lots of practical advice, but also um, they have something where you can search and look at the different financial support available to you. So that can include things like grants as well. And then finally, the Red Cross I've linked there as well, because it's worth um, looking at what's available in your local area, because they can provide support with things like loaning equipment, um, such as wheelchairs or toilet raisers, things like that. Um, but also they can provide help with that, the more practical help. So whether that's transport to medical appointments or someone collecting food shopping for you um, or you know, collecting prescriptions, things like that. Um, they have people available for that as well. So that was my whistle stop tour in home adaptations when you're living on your own.